This is Apologetics Profile, a podcast ministry of Watchman Fellowship Incorporated, Arlington, Texas, helping and equipping you to better understand the world of non-Christian ideas and religions, one conversation at a time. In the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul asks aloud how Israel could call upon Christ for salvation if they have never heard of him. Quote, how then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? End quote. Just a few verses later, however, Paul says, quote, but I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have, end quote. He then cites the Old Testament, specifically Psalm 19, verse 4, a passage talking about the heavens. Quote, Their voice has gone out into all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. End quote. Paul seems to be comparing the heavens' silent universal declaration of God's glory throughout the whole world to the universal proclamation of the gospel. In the specific context of Romans 10, Paul has in mind his Jewish brethren. The following insights come from the late theologian John R. W. Stott's commentary on the book of Romans, page 288. Stott mentions theologian F. F. Bruce's observation that Paul's language here is, quote, representative universalism, end quote, meaning that wherever there was a Jewish community, quote, there the gospel had been preached, end quote. This is something similar to what Paul says in Colossians, that the gospel, quote, has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, end quote. And today, the knowledge of the gospel is indeed known throughout the whole world. Every major world religion outside the Christian faith, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Judaism, not to mention many other sectarian religious movements and cults, all have something to say about the lowly itinerant rabbi from first century Nazareth one who, for all intents and purposes, should have been lost to history. Jesus asks his disciples, Who do men say that I am? It is a question still very much relevant for us today who claim to know Jesus as Lord, the Christ, the Son of the living God, especially as we live within a culture of ever-increasing religious plurality and diversity. Do we know what people of other faiths or no faith are saying about Jesus? Is Jesus just a mythical figure, a good teacher, a good example, God consciousness? Mohandas Gandhi, for example, confessed, quote, It was more than I could believe that Jesus was the only incarnate Son of God, and that only he who believed in him would have everlasting life. I could accept Jesus as a martyr, an embodiment of sacrifice, and a divine teacher, but not as the most perfect man ever born." End quote. Muslims believe Jesus, Isa as he is referred to in the Quran, was a prophet to be respected, obeyed, and revered, but he was not the Son of God, he was not God, and he did not die on Cross. The Hindu scholar Swami Akhilananda, who lectured in the U.S. about Hinduism just before his death in 1962, said Hindus do not see Jesus as God, but merely as one of many manifestations of divine incarnations throughout history, what Hindus commonly refer to as avatars. Jesus in this sense is just like Krishna, Buddha, and others, not God himself, but a manifestation of, quote, God consciousness, end quote. Many Jewish believers do not accept that Jesus is Yahweh incarnate or that Jesus is the Messiah prophesied in Isaiah 53. And what of Christians? Who do we say Jesus is? We believe Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Yahweh incarnate, who was born of a virgin, died by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate, and rose again on the third Jewish day. Yet, this early belief in Jesus' divinity was a remarkable and sudden departure from monotheistic Judaism of first century Palestine. As the late historian of early Christianity Larry Hurtado observes, quote, In terms of the religious scruples of the ancient Jewish tradition, 
The most striking innovation in earliest Christian circles was to include Christ with God as a recipient of cultic devotion. What could have prompted such a major innovation in the devotional scruples and practices that were inherited from the Jewish tradition? What might have moved Christian Jews to feel free to offer to Christ this unparalleled cultic devotion? In light of the characteristic reluctance of devout Jews to accord cultic reverence to any figure other than God, it seems likely that those very early circles who took the step of according to Christ such reverence would have done so only if they felt compelled by God. End quote. So who do you say Jesus is? It is arguably one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves. As C.S. Lewis answered the question, quote, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to." End quote. Some critics have suggested that Lewis's lunatic, liar, or lord argument left out legend. Perhaps Jesus was just some legend borrowed from pagan mythologies, or that false ideas and incidents were attributed to him after his death. In 1931, Lord of the Rings author J.R.R. Tolkien penned a short poem entitled Mythopoeia after a conversation he had had with his friend C.S. Lewis about myth and truth. The conversation took place as they were walking together along a footpath on the grounds of Magdalen College in Oxford, known as Addison's Walk. It was this particular conversation which ignited the smoldering wick in Lewis's own heart towards Christ. Tolkien begins the poem with an observation about how Lewis, at the time, was using language to describe nature. You look at the trees and label them just so, for trees are trees, and growing is to grow. You walk the earth and tread with solemn pace, one of the many minor globes of space. A star's a star, some matter in a ball, compelled to courses mathematical. Amid the regimented cold inane, where destined atoms are each moment slain. And on that fateful night, as Tolkien and Lewis, along with their friend Hugo Dyson, solemnly conversed about the nature of myth, Lewis remarked how he loved mythology, but knew that myths are lies, even though lies breathed through silver. Tolkien corrected him. Lewis recalls the details of that night in a letter to his friend Arthur Greaves. It was really a memorable walk. We began in Addison's Walk, just after dinner, on metaphor and myth, interrupted by a rush of wind, which came so suddenly on the still warm evening and sent so many leaves pattering down that we thought it was raining. We all held our breath, the other two appreciating the ecstasy of such a thing almost as you would. Tolkien's biographer, Humphrey Carpenter, captures how Tolkien was inspired by the arrival of the breathtaking gust as it burst through the trees, incorporating the moment into the discussion. Myths are not lies, he told Lewis. And indicating the great trees of Magdalen Grove as their branches bent in the wind, he struck out a different line of argument. You call a tree a tree, he said, and you think nothing more of the word. But it was not a tree until someone gave it that name. You call a star a star and say it is just a ball of matter moving on a mathematical course. But that is merely how you see it. 
By so naming things and describing them, you are only inventing your own terms about them. Just as speech is invention about objects and ideas, so is myth an invention about truth. Lewis notes in his letter to Greaves that, We continued in my room on Christianity, a good long satisfying talk in which I learned a lot, then discussed the difference between love and friendship, and then finally drifted back to poetry and books. In his collection of essays, Weight of Glory, Lewis later offered his own insights about what he thought of the similarities found between Christianity, myths, and other religions. Quote, what light is really thrown on the truth or falsehood of Christian theology by the occurrence of similar ideas in pagan religion? I think the answer was very well given a fortnight ago by Mr. Brown. Supposing for purposes of argument that Christianity is true, then it could avoid all coincidence with other religions only on the supposition that all other religions are 100% erroneous. To which you remember, Professor H. H. Price replied by agreeing with Mr. Brown and saying, yes, from these resemblances you may conclude not so much worse for the Christians, but so much better for the pagans. The truth is that the resemblances tell nothing either for or against the truth of Christian theology. If you start from the assumption that the theology is false, the resemblances are quite consistent with that assumption. One would expect creatures of the same sort, faced with the same universe, to make the same false guesses more than once. But if you start with the assumption that the theology is true, the resemblances fit in equally well. We should, therefore, expect to find in the imagination of great pagan teachers and myth-makers some glimpse of that theme which we believe to be the very plot of the whole cosmic story, the theme of incarnation, death, and rebirth and the differences between the pagan Christs, Baldur, Osiris, etc., and the Christ himself is much what we should expect to find. The pagan stories are all about someone dying and rising, either every year or else nobody knows where and nobody knows when. The Christian story is about a historical personage whose execution can be dated pretty accurately under a named Roman magistrate and with who the society he had founded is in a continuous relation down to the present day. It is not the difference between falsehood and truth. It is the difference between a real event on the one hand and dim dreams or premonitions of that same event on the other. It is like watching something come gradually into focus. First, it hangs in the clouds of myth and ritual, vast and vague. Then it condenses, grows hard, and in a small sense, as a historical event in first century Palestine. End quote. On this two-part episode of Apologetics Profile, we speak with world-renowned New Testament historian and professor of philosophy at Liberty University, Dr. Gary Happermas, about the ways in which people of other religions and worldviews speak of Jesus, and how we as Christians can respond including what's wrong with the idea that the Gospels were mere legends and that Jesus was just a myth. As we begin our conversation, Gary shares how Jesus holds a unique status in all other world religions and how we as Christians in conversation with people of other faiths can begin with Jesus. Here is Dr. Gary Habermas. Jesus is arguably the only major founder of a major world religion who is revered in all the other world religions. He's the only one. And that even includes Judaism, because there's been an increase of Jewish writers in the last few decades who have said things like, with, without believing him to be the son of God or something, they'll say things like, well, why should I be upset with Jesus? He was Jewish. I'm Jewish. He was a very wise man. Why would I ever put, why would I ever put that down? You know, those kind of comments. So he's g generically, frequently called a prophet in Judaism. Um, in Islam, I think this would surprise a lot of people. There's almost 100 verses on Jesus in the Quran, and they're very, very positive. It's, it's generally said, I'm not a Muslim scholar, but it's very, very frequently said that Jesus is the second holiest person, second only to Muhammad. And 
I even I debated in England years ago a um, Muslim theologian who himself was the head of about seven mosques, I think he said, in England. And when he spoke Jesus' name, I don't know if it was for my benefit or what, but when he spoke Jesus' name, he said, peace be upon him, the same way, the same saying he appended to Muhammad's name. So I, I think this is a pretty good time with a lot of openness to Jesus. Dan, let me give one other comment. In the, in the 19th century, German liberalism, which was a theological movement that dominated the Western world, uh, it's where all the, a lot of the really liberal positions um, started but they were opposed by a lot of scholars too. At any rate, they used to make comment. They used to make a comment about their own theology. And I think it applies here. They would say, we have no problem with the Jesus of history and the many, many, many things we can write about him. As long as you don't want to talk sectarian theology or miracles. So now I think most Christian apologists would want to keep both those in there. But if you don't want to rant and rave, they would say, about things like Jesus' deity and his resurrection, the rest of his life is historically attested. And the 19th century German thinkers are famous for writing many, many books about the historical Jesus where they could give hundreds of comments about Jesus. So that kind of generic get the heavy theology and get the miracles out and Hey, we're buddies. Um, I think that goes for a fair amount of the world today. Hmm. So it, it seems like we could use certainly as Christians, the, the idea that uh, um, the affirmation of the existence of Jesus, um, uh, the acknowledgement, not only that he existed, but that he was someone to be revered or at least uh, a wise individual, a wise teacher. Um, and so it's it's a and I actually use this myself when I talk to skeptics. I say, you know, they ask me what's the one reason that you believe in Jesus? <laughs> and I say Jesus himself. I mean, working at Watchman these last few years, I have come to realize as your your article has pointed out, just how central Christ is to a to a cult, to to another world religion that that he is spoken of yep. um uh, in in a multitude of different ways from UFO cults all the way through Hinduism and everything. Um, but I thought you started your your book, um, your online book, with um, some Eastern thinking through Buddha, Confucius, and uh, Taoism. Um, yep. There's not a lot of Buddhas and Confucianists and Taoists in Texas here, so I'm not extraordinarily familiar. But I did some background reading uh, from a book. I think it was footnoted in your article, Christianity, Some Non-Christian Appraisals. It was edited by David McCain. And it features, yes. it features uh, articles written by Hindus, Buddhists, uh, Jews, and Muslims uh, yep. about Christianity. And I found it, the, the articles that I've been reading are just fascinating. One of the things that you can comment on here is that, that you, you talk about that Buddha, Confucius, and Taoism, the, the leaders of these movements are not claiming to be divine. They are maybe better a way to put it would be sort of vessels or conduits of what new agers might call god consciousness or something that this idea that that we're vessels of truth we are not claiming divinity that seems to be an early distinction that you make in the in the essay here about the difference between jesus and buddha and confucius the, the, this idea of divinity they're good teachers they see Jesus as a good teacher, but they don't. There's no claim to divinity within those Eastern religions, correct? There are some claims to divinity, but here's here's a two ways to look at it. Easterners in general, whether it's Hindu, uh, you know, Indian forms of Hinduism, whether it's Buddhism from India over to China and Japan. Um, and the islands, the Philippines, and so on, whatever the forms of these religions, on the one hand, they tend to be very accepting of other persons' religion, so Jesus would make the grade. And they, and as you could tell from that book, the McCain book, I used that in grad school for many years. In fact, it, it says negative things about Christianity, mostly what every, what the most common critique of Christians from Friedrich Schleiermacher, the German who started 
uh, liberalism, 19th century liberalism, ger- it's just not a derogatory term, ger- liberalism. It's their term. German liberalism was a movement. And Schleiermacher, from he, that point on, they were doing these lives of Jesus. And Schleiermacher himself did one. And I think when you read those things from McCain, the, the most common critique is the Gospels have contradictions. That's the most common critique. Hmm. And it's easily answered, not the way easily answered. <laughs> Someone says, it's not easy. There's a hundred problems you got to look at. I, I don't know what number. And and they go, he says it's easy. Well, then he's wrong from the start. Well, I'm not talking easy to work through a hundred texts. What I'm talking about is easy to see that, well, as I do the minimal facts argument for the resurrection, if you use only the facts which the critics admit, be they liberal, be they from Schleiermacher to the present, if you use their data, you can see that Jesus claimed to be deity and was raised from the dead. So you can get the major doctrines from their concessions. So you can get there. But that kind of generic, everybody appreciates Jesus thing, it comes from the 1800, from Schleiermacher 1799. Uh, well, there's two dates for his major book, 1798 and 99. But from that uh, time to the present, there's that generic, if you don't get too pushy, we're okay with Jesus. The, the other thing I would say is that's one. There's a general appreciation. In fact, let me tell you this. I think I quote uh, Gandhi in that writing that you're referring to. Uh, at least I do in, in another one or two on this subject. But Gandhi says something like, even if Jesus didn't exist, everything that was taught that he taught is still true. Mm-hmm. And that's typical of Indian thought. You can judge truth even if it wasn't spoken by an historical voice. Okay, so that's that's one thing about generally accepting. The second thing is the one I just hinted at. For the for the Indian sources east to Japan, there is very little emphasis on history. And uh, one Buddhist book I have on my shelf here says, we don't have any evidence for the text like Christians do. And then he goes on and says, he's a Buddhist PhD. And he says, quite surprisingly, we don't even know what Buddha taught. Mm -hmm. We don't even know what Buddha taught. We got to stop and think about that because scholars say right and left, Buddha taught, Buddha taught, Buddha taught. And some of the best insider scholars say, yeah, we don't know what he taught because the sources are really late. So the second thing is they don't, they're not crazy about history. So they don't do well when their documents, I can give you incredible stats, but there's huge gaps between when their prophet died, be it Buddha or Zoroaster or, uh, Krishna, there are huge gaps between when they wrote, when their prophet died and when they wrote. So those two things, general acceptance of Jesus, quit talking to me about the big theology and the miracles, and some of them even accept those. And then secondly, don't talk, you know, history's not important to me. Hmm. And that's, that's interesting too, because in your article, you do make a couple of good points about the discrepancies of dates. And uh, as you say, yeah. I think you say, uh, you know, modern scholars of, of the Gospels and the Epistles and the New Testament will throw everything in the kitchen sink at it in terms of plausible what happened, how did this happen, this could have, the, the, right. nat- the natural explanations. But when it comes to Buddha or other religions, they give a wink and a pass to, that's <laughs> very uncritical that's right. in accepting what these other religions um, talk about. And and so just for our audience, for, for the sake of what we're talking about here in terms of textual, uh, historical um, unimportance, just some qualitative uh, analysis of the Gospels and the manuscripts versus what we have of Zoroaster, what we have of uh, the Bhagavad Gita, and what we have of Buddhist teachings. We're talking not decades, we're not talking centuries, we're talking in some cases with Zoroaster and, uh, and Vishnu or Krishna with the Bhagavad Gita, we're talking a millennia or more. Of a gap. That's correct. It, could you explain That's a little correct. bit why this is this is so important for the Gospels? Yeah. Um, well, I'll give a few dates. I often, when I lecture on the resurrection, I often use Alexander the Great as an example. Now, he's not a religious example, but I'm trying to say, you think secular history is so much better than the Gospels. Well, let's take a look. Who's better known prior to the Roman Empire, or maybe even through a good deal of the Roman Empire, or maybe through the whole Roman Empire? 
there's hardly a better known figure in the ancient world than Alexander the Great. I mean, who conquers the known world by the time they're 33? Um, <laughs> right. And yet, the early, there, there were early biographies of Alexander, very early ones, even eyewitness, but they're no longer in existence as far as we know. I tell people we might find them in the monasteries someday, but we don't have them now. And the best, the first biographies almost 300 years later, the best biographies, Plutarch and Arian, are four and a quarter to 450 years later. Now, when you think about that, that's almost half a millennium for maybe the best known historical figure, at least military, in the ancient world. Hmm. So I use Alexander and people accuse me of using a lousy example with big date gaps. I'll say, <laughs> well, okay, would you rather have me shift to the religious guys? Yeah, 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 do that because that's close to what we're talking about. Yeah, okay, but you're not going to like it. Um and that book on Buddhism that I've already referred to where the, the PhD scholar, a British, British professor, by the way, pa passed away, but he had a prestigious position. Um, he said, we can't even know what Buddha taught. Well, he goes on to say that he was collecting what he considered the best Buddhist writings in this little book called Buddhist scriptures. And he said, most, if I remember these dates correctly, most of the sources in this book date 600 to 800 years after Buddha's death. Wow. 600 after 800 years. That's one. One article, a, his, a history journal article, not religious, history journal article, uh, the author says, if I remember correctly, that in Japan, the dates for Buddhist, Buddha's birth, and maybe death, but I think birth, uh, birth, been a long time since I looked at this statistic, the dates vary by as much as almost 2,000 years. Now, people say, well, yeah, we're not sure if Jesus was born four years B.C. or six years B.C. I go, really? Four to six years? Well, Buddha's 2,000 in Japan alone, according to this historian. Um, now, the books you're talking about, uh, Zoroaster's main theology is Ebon Yamauchi, a uh, retired professor of ancient history from University of Miami of Ohio. Ed Yamauchi said that the earliest sources for Zoroaster are 1,000. One of the major theological sources are 1,000. Another one's 1,300 years later. Hmm. The Upanishads, which one author compares to the Gospels, not in their, not in storytelling about these founders, but in their importance for the religion. And the Upanishads were not gathered oftentimes until 1,700 years after they were written. See, that's because it's the Eastern view is truth is truth, and truth comes from the writings, not from who said it or when they lived. And that's why why uh, Gandhi could say it's almost immaterial to me whether Jesus lived or not, because uh, his teachings are still true. That, that's kind of a funny thing. If he didn't live, his teachings are still true. Who's the his there? Who's the pronoun? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then the last one you mentioned, Krishna, yeah, the earliest – so the earliest copy of the Krishna, um, if I remember correctly, is uh, for over 4,000 years after Krishna was believed to live. Was it 13th century, I think? I'll have to go back and look at it. But it's, you're, you have to, you're talking, Yeah, you're talking about the manuscripts. Right. Krishna, I have one source that says, by Hindu scholars, that says Krishna probably never lived. That, no, the person was saying that's the majority of Hindu scholars, that Krishna never lived. So you have to know when he lived and how long this is after. But the century that they listed, it was 13, the 1300s would make it 1700 years later because he was put by this guy. He was put in the fourth century B.C., which is the 300s mm -hmm. B.C. So right there would be 1600 years at least. Um, and so those are examples. And they'd say, well, who cares? If Krishna lived now, somebody, some of your listeners might just kind of speak up and because this is the tradition they're in, um, they're mythicists. They don't believe Jesus lived. They generally, generally don't have, I'm not saying you've got to have a college degree to be smart. I'm not saying that, but when, when guys don't go to school and don't study this stuff, and then they claim to be ancient historians, which happens, it's infuriating, but it happens. They're an ancient historian because they've read some books. Um, they will say things like, ah, well, then Krishna's just like Jesus because he never lived. And here's the difference. 
the quote I gave says that the majority Hindu scholarly view is that Krishna probably never lived. Bart Ehrman, the atheist New Testament scholar, probably best known skeptic in this uh, country, um, said that, well, he has a lot to say about Jesus, but he goes off in these Jesus mythers and he says, you know something, guys? There's only two or three of you that have good credentials of the of the dozens and dozens of you who just go off. There's two of you with good credentials, and they don't have a university position. They don't have a, 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 a an accredited. They're not an accredited school, seminary, college, or university. And he goes on to say what he means by position. They have to. They should teach in, a, in an accredited school because otherwise the school wouldn't. He says he specifically says. Uh, they wouldn't be hired because their views are so crazy. Now, you can be hired to teach mechanical engineering, but you wouldn't be hired to teach religion and and so on if you believe Jesus didn't live. That's how far out that view is. But mm-hmm. I just said that because some of your listeners will say, ah, Krishna's like Jesus. Yeah, but the scholars say that about Krishna. The non-scholars say it about Jesus. Bart Ehrman says of the thousands of, uh, he might have say, he might say of 10,000, professors of religion and the like in this country, accredited people. He said, I've never heard any of them in person or in writing say Jesus never lived. Mm. That's, Mm. that's a, that's a long way from most say he didn't live with Krishna. Yes. We just had uh, Bob Price on our book club uh, this month and we were talking about this this very topic. And I asked Bob a a question. He's a really nice guy. I mean, he was, he is very amicable, fun to talk to. Um, But I'd asked him a question because we were reading his recent uh, compendium of essays, um, The Varieties of Mythicist Experiences. And uh, one thing uh-huh. that came up that was really interesting, that the, one of the critics, one of the earlier critics, I forgot the scholar's name, I think it was in the, I, I don't, he, he came up with this term parallelism, where, um, yeah. and, and this is something that Bob did, and I asked him about it. And I said, Bob, you, Bob went to a, uh, an inscription from the, the Asclepium, um, and he, he is, predates uh, Luke's gospel by four centuries, and Bob's saying, look, this inscription at the Asclepium uh, is like the passage in Luke and the Emmaus Road. Therefore, I think whoever Luke was borrowed from this inscription, and therefore, and I, I, I was asking him to make the connection historically, and and he, he didn't. He just said, well, it just seems to me uh, that, that, that it's similar, and this is exactly what the, the critique of, of parallelism was that anything in the ancient world that seems even remotely similar to anything in the gospels the gospels must be borrowing from the the, these more ancient sources usually the old testament yeah yeah yeah. um i i I know bob well and i think if bob and i were talking bob would tell everybody that i'm his friend and i would tell people that bob's my friend we've known each other for um something think well over 30 years and and he's even invited me down to his house to talk about these things i i i've got a you know one of the one day or another, I'd like to do it. But um, that's interesting when he says that. I was, the where I met Bob was at a series of debates. A bunch of guys were together for a weekend to lecture and debate, a bunch. I mean, there were dozens of debates, as I remember, um, at least dozens of people involved in them. And, and Bob, by his teammate, who was a Jesus Seminar member, so is Bob, um, His teammate said to him, uh, because Bob was given some of these parallels that you're talking about. And so I'm just sitting there listening to him. I haven't met Bob yet. Met him the next day, spent time with him. But that guy says to Bob, he goes, Bob, let's get off this parallelomania kit. (laughs) Parallelomania. So it's not just parallelism. Yeah, that's the right word. That's the right. That's the word. That's correct. Thanks, Gary. That's exactly. Parallelomania. That's right. That's right. And Dan, I think your I think your critique is right on because here's the problem with this kind of stuff. Bob's got two great PhDs. Yes, smart guy and intimidating if you don't know what your stuff is, you know. He's smart. He's got two PhDs and he's very well read. Okay. But Bob, I don't want to criticize him for anything, but if I have to say this, if we were dialoguing, we did have a dialogue once. Um, He says, just what you said. Okay, let's take that claim. This is back there in Asclepius or in the Old Testament. And I think the Gospels might have used it because the story is similar. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I go time out, time out. Um, Bob, I don't blame you for not having studied 
philosophy because you might get on my case. I have a Greek minor, but I don't know Greek that well. And he's got a New Testament. He's got a PhD in New Testament. So, Bob, you might get on my case for citing the Greek wrong, and I have to listen to you. But I'm a philosophy professor. And let me tell you something. I just wrote this yesterday to a couple of guys who asked me, when you go back in time and find incidents, you cannot say that because X five centuries ago is similar to Y centuries later, they probably got the idea from the same place. What's missing there is exactly what you said. I want the continuity. I want the argument that they even read the culture of that time. Let's say it's Greek and let's say it's Mesopotamian. Do you think Galilean fishermen were reading Greek philosophers or Mesopotamian gurus? I mean, that's the problem with a critique that's often given by philosophers. But I'll say that's a consistency argument. And I just read an argument, nothing to do with anything we're talking about, but the author said, this is this weekend, the author said, what I'm finding here is consistent with this view here. And the two were arguably centuries apart. And so I wrote a critique just to my friends. I wasn't publishing it, but I wrote, yeah, it's consistent with this view over here hundreds of years earlier, but could it have been consistent with the with the view hundreds of years later <laughs> i mean uh, let's put it this way mormons and christians i lived next door to a mormon couple uh family for a long time great family great family people they're known for this uh, evangelical christians and mormons could be very close in their ethics in their raising families jerry falwell senior made famous the uh, moral majority where Mormons and Jews were a good part of the constituency. All right, so we can share morality and we can share family life. That doesn't mean we believe the same things. Or you can have a, you can have a liberal in politics who's very concerned about ethics and has a little bit to share with the conservative, and that's about where it stops. So because, because Bob might say, well, that just sounds good to me. And you'd say, where's the line? And he goes, well, it's just similar. Similar means almost nothing when you compare it over the centuries, because you could say, well, it's also con it's also uh, similar to this and that. And we know these two groups are not the same. So that argument doesn't move me at all. Well, uh, that brings me to the next question that you bring up in your article. And I think it's very important today because a lot of atheists will will take this line. Um, and I see it. So there's two ways I want to approach this, and then you can go wherever you want to with it. One sure. is, I'm sure you're somewhat familiar with C.S. Lewis's conversion, his his talk with J.R.R. Tolkien back in the early yep. 20th century, where um, Lewis was expressing his love of mythology. And, you know, they have that conversation on Addison's Road, and Tolkien says, you know, Christianity is the true myth. And then this becomes one of Lewis's powerful arguments for the for the Christian faith, that if the Christianity is true and Jesus is who he said he is and the Gospels are uh, how the world is, then we would expect to find copies or similarities among other mm -hmm. religions. And so it's a mm -hmm. proactive apologetic argument from Lewis's standpoint. But in the inverse, Gary, it seems to be a, a, a couple of things. One, in the book that I've been reading by McCain and in your essay, it seems to be a kind of opportunistic means for syncretism of of a sort of pluralistic religious ideology where you can just combine all these different things and it's sort of like an Oprahism. All things, all roads eventually lead to the plateau of God or God consciousness. And so uh, it's this idea of tolerance. I was reading it in Gandhi. I was reading it in the Buddhist literature that that we can sort of tolerate everything that's good about our religions and and eventually take different paths and come to the same God. And then there's the atheist objection that says, well, look at Christianity. It's just a recycled myth uh, of of previous religions from which it has borrowed because it, it, its texts are much later than um, you know the Bhagavad Gita or the or Buddha or, or uh, uh, the Babylonians or something. They're borrowing from texts that predate it. So I know there's three strains and a lot to talk about there. But so kind of addressing the the similarities, Lewis's argument, uh, the the, the 
the atheist objection and then the sort of religious syncretism or pluralism where it takes what we have in common uh, as a kind of uh, a religion of a new age kind of combination of all religions lead to God. Um, a lot to unpack there. You can take it wherever you want to. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would go a lot of places too. C.S. Lewis comments where I, where I thought you were going um, in his miracles book. He, uh, he says, I was schooled on the view. Now, now you're talking about a guy who was born in the 19th century. And at that time he went to school later, of course, but, in the early 20th, but um, you're talking about a guy who was at the heyday that time of quote unquote parallelomania. There was a movement called, well, the German is uh, religion Geschichte. It's history of religions is what it means. And it was a a view that tried to find Christian uh, beliefs in previous mythology. And it was a big movement for a while, and then it crashed. It crashed and burned, and it's like never made its way back because ending about 1920, maybe. I'm not saying ending. I mean, there's a few guys that would take it every once in a while. But the view crashed for a lot of reasons. And some of those reasons are um, that the examples they used of mythology, they post dated Christianity, not predated Christianity. That's a big one. I'm giving examples. I mean, uh, uh, Adonis, uh, some of the dying and rising gods, supposedly. Um, Adonis was an example, I think the first one for which we have clear manuscript evidence. Only here's the problem. In this first, in, in this first clear data, Adonis is uh, second and third century AD. Mm. Well, that's about 100 years after Christianity. So who, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? (laughs) Um, Bruce Metzger uh, may be the best Greek scholar who's ever lived. Uh, Bruce Metzger did some writing on these ancient religions, and he says, we know for a fact that some of these religions not only dated after Christianity, but they copied from Christianity. And he gave an example or two. And one of them was the the previous mythological religion on gods and goddesses who everybody says never lived. But those people, using kind of the Eastern view that what they taught was important, not so much where they walked and talked in space and time, but but these, these guys, they would preach something like this. If you're converted and they'd off, often pour blood over them or give sacrifices. It was that time, of, you know, in the world. And they would say, you can join this and your life will be exceptionally different. You can live better and enjoy life. Well, Christians came to town and they were preaching. This is an example Metzger gives. And the, Christ, the Christians were preaching. And they're going, yeah, 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 this life will be fine. But even better, you can have eternal life. And after that message came to town, the 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 mythic the mythicist um, uh, description, and I don't mean mythicist like they didn't think Jesus lived, but mythicist like, like uh, you know, using ancient mythology and drawing parallels. Uh, and th- then they then when the Christians leave town, the mythicists were saying, yeah, 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 you can have eternal life in our religion too. So Metzger says, see, you see that change from um, fun in this life to and in the life to come. Now, let's see who gets the most converts. And so that's one problem. A lot of these religions uh, were after. Another big problem was that the story that they wove, the most famous one is Frazier's Golden Bow, which is still a classic. Back, he was writing, Frazier was writing back in the 1880s and 1890s. And he spun this tale of when you put all the world religions together, here's the kind of person you get. Well, they started looking And he, first of all, at that time, they didn't know when a lot of these things came from. They didn't know what dates. Secondly, a lot of them were post-Christian. And he he just stirred the pot. He's not the only one. They stirred the pot, and the amalgam they gave was a historical mess, and it didn't calculate historically. And you don't have to be a Christian historian to go after these guys. So some of them post-dated, some of them, they were, and they would have no evidence for these little tiny, you, you asked Bob Price for these causal 
connections. They didn't have any evidence for the causal connections. They just stirred them all up and said, look what we have. So that would be a couple of my comments, that one. And Lewis, how about Lewis's comment? He goes on to say, you know, I came into Christianity thinking I would find mythology all over the place and little hints of mythology. He said, I found none of it in the Gospels. And one last thing, Dan, just a one-liner. You said they're complaining about the Christian text. Yeah, John is dated by critics and and uh, non-critics alike. John is a whole 65 years after the death of Jesus, 65. They complain about 65, and they'll go off. Like opponents often do this, right? We do it in politics. We do it in, in various religions. 65 years. How long can you remember something? Blah, 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 blah. What me- what's memory? 65 years. And then you find out that the earliest Buddhist sources are 6,800 years. The Upanishads are 1,700 years. The Bhagavad Gita is off the chart at thousands. Uh, Zoroaster is 1,000 th- 1, to 1,300 if you're going to talk to me about 65 years, and in the ancient historical world, that's great. A lot of the great Roman writers wrote later than that after the Caesars. And we don't say Suetonius said this, and it's not true. Tacitus said this, and he probably doesn't know what he's talking about. They always go, Suetonius said this about Julius Caesar. Uh, Tacitus said this about Caesar Augustus. And we take it at face value. They get a free pass. They get a free, that's what you said. Yep. Basically, I know you bring this up, and this is along the lines of what we're talking about here. You bring up um, uh, the late Larry Hurtado, who is a, a tremendous scholar about early yeah. Christianity. Uh, right. He has this, I think it's his best work, the Lord Jesus Christ, where yep. he documents um, the radical difference between the Greco Roman pantheon of gods. And the early explosive worship of Christ as Yahweh uh, from monotheistic temple attending Jewish people in first century Jerusalem. This is a a radical. Uh, Hurtado is you know art, outlines this. It's it's just a radical appearance of worshiping this man, this figure, and so it. Hurtado scholarship seems to, well, it doesn't seem to, I think it does an excellent job of putting to bed this idea that Christianity was simply borrowed paganism because the early Christians would have nothing to do with paganism, that they were called right. atheists yep. because they weren't worshiping the pantheon. And so, I mean, I think it's Tacitus or Pliny the Younger in his letter um, expressing what he would do to people that he would ask who were Christians. Um, yep. And one of the things he, he got them yeah. to do was to deny Jesus by worshiping the the, the, the gods and denouncing Christ. But I think right. I think uh, just speak a little bit there about Hurtado's scholarship and how this is so contrary to the to the idea that Christianity is a, a borrowed myth. Yeah, one one comment uh, before I talk about Larry. Um, one comment about uh, Pliny. He's writing about 120 A.D. and he's talking. That's pretty early. Now, see, notice what I just caught myself saying. That's pretty early. That's 90 years after Jesus. Hey, well, look, the Gospel of John was 25 years earlier than that. So, but Pliny doesn't only describe catching people if they fail to take an oath to the gods and worship God, he kills them. And he's asking the Caesar, am I doing the right thing? And the Caesar, we have two letters like this from Trajan and from Hadrian, two Caesars. And they write back one of them to Pliny and the other one later. And they say, hey, don't go too hard on these guys. If you stumble across them and they're being contra society, you might have to do something. But don't go after them. Don't take lists of people's names and don't try to get them to recant if, if they're not doing something wrong. So that's that's good. But Hurtado is very well known. And he and Richard Baucom are the one-two punch. Jimmy Dunn, James Dunn, unfortunately, he and Hurtado, two of the three have passed away and, and Hurtado and Baucom's not young. But... Um, uh, he, he, his big argument, Hurtado's, is early worship. I mean, real early worship, 30s right. AD. Right. Real early worship shows that the Jews, who are monotheistic law abiders, worship Jesus, and that's a bridge too far for these people. Why in the world were they worshiping him just years later? Mm-hmm. And Barkham, they, they both use a, 
other arguments, but Bauckham uses the argument that when the New Testament, the creeds, these early pre-Christian memorized statements are from the 30s, are copied into the epistles later by the authors. I don't mean somebody else put them there. By the authors, um, Bauckham's argument is these earliest renditions of what they believed take verses applied to Yahweh and the Old Testament, the holiest names for God, and apply them to Jesus. Wow. Right. I mean, if you call him a God, I can understand that. If you call him divine, which is usually thought to be a, le- a little bit lesser word than the word deity, but if you if you want to make him something smaller, that's fine. But you guys are using the words for Jehovah. This is a Jew talking to a Jew um, in, the, in the 30s. Why in the world are you putting them on a pedestal and saying things like, here's three bombastic things they both found, Hurtado and Bauckham, three things. Jesus was worshipped. Whoa, that's a no-no. Uh, number two, probably the biggest one, he was called, called a co-occupier of God's throne. Hey, listen. I could see the Jews talking to the other one. Look, whatever you say, don't say he's on the throne with God. I mean, that's blasphemy. Yeah, uh, that's the passage in Matthew where he ta- the high priest tears his clothes. Yeah, well, by the way, that Matthew passage is really clear. The earliest one, Mark 14, 61 to 64, I think is probably the best verse for Jesus claiming deity in the New Testament. Certainly mm-hmm. one of the top few. Okay, mm-hmm. so the third one is, he was pre-existent. So yeah, his parents were Joseph and Mary, but are you telling me what? He created the world? Are you crazy? He was only 33 years old, 30, whatever, 30-ish years old when he died. What do you mean created the world? Now those are that those are three bridges too far. Uh occupying God's throne, created the world. You know, those kind of teachings, and especially using the name for God in the New Testament. So that's the big argument that Hurtado and Baca made. And guess what? Uh, scholarship has largely moved over to that view. I mean, even critics, they'll try to explain in other ways, but they often do not deny that that is what happened in the earliest church. Yeah, yeah. Um, we talked about the resurrection back in January. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, of late, I've been talking to to a group of um, of skeptics about, um, I'm, sh- I'm sure you know uh, John Loftus is. Um, sure do. He's another friend of mine, like, <laughs> like, like Bob Price. So, so Loftus uh, came out with his book in 2013, "The Outsider Test for Faith." Are you yeah. familiar with that work? Have you know what? I am. Okay, so so I've I've been engaging a lot of skeptics for the last couple of months who love this uh, idea um, mm-hmm. of the outsider test, and a lot of times, um, the, the skeptic who puts forth this outsider test is not really well versed in in Islam or uh, or uh, Hinduism, um, but they will spring on unsuspecting Christians the idea of, well, you know, couldn't somebody who believes in Vishnu uh, have the same kind of experience as somebody who is a Christian? Wouldn't somebody who thinks, you know, Allah is, is the one true God, wouldn't they have a, a and so it's a, a colloquial way of applying John's outsider test without saying, hey, I'm using an atheist John Loftus' outsider test for faith, and do you look at other faiths the way you look at your own? But um, I, I had, uh, I had you know, of course at Watchmen, we dig into comparative religious studies, and what one thing was interesting, and you mentioned this in your essay, and I thought maybe we could talk about it a little bit, is uh, the Hindu idea of of avatars and the appearances of Vishnu Krishna. And I found this fascinating because for the, the modern Krishnas, the International Society of Krishna Consciousness, uh, there's a temple here in Dallas that uh, James had taken me to and we had a discussion with the guru there. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting because the Krishnas believe that Vishnu is an avatar of Krishna. And the Vishnavite, the Vashnavites believe the opposite, that Vishnu is the primary deity and Krishna is his avatar. But this this idea of the Hindu god appearing, um, you know, as you said earlier, we're not even sure in the essay, you're not even sure if, if you know, Krishna Vishnu was a historical personage or just some sort of poetic uh, depository for where these texts came from. But um, you mentioned in your essay how Vishnu or Krishna appears every 8.6 million years on earth. Um, 
but but this concept of avatar and i was reading in the hindu essay in in Cain's, mccain's book um the appearances that, that that hindus see jesus as just a kind of avatar like appearance along with the, the other ways in which krishna vishnu has appeared um but but we don't have anything concrete historically anything like uh, the gospel narratives when it comes to uh, the vishnu krishna appearances in the world i mean there's nothing uh, but as you say the the history of this doesn't matter the truth of it seems to be what what is uh clear here but uh maybe just speak a little bit well, about what did the what did the priests tell you oh well he you know of course jesus is an influence influential teacher but uh for the most part from what i understood from the conversation and from what i've read that jesus is is kind of revered in some sense as as a manifestation of either depending on where you're coming from either krishna or vishnu it's just one way in which an avatar of 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 the hindu deity who is you know in hinduism god is not anything he's sort of an essence a vague kind of maybe like a force or something and who appears uh as the bhagavad gita says anytime there is uh, lawlessness on the earth and so as far as i understand for the international Con- uh, society of krishna consciousness uh they believe for the most part, Jesus is just another kind of avativistic uh, appearance of of, of the right. hin- Hindu deity. It's pretty pretty high, though. For that's a pretty high acclamation for a Hindu. You know, uh, uh, we don't cite other people, other religious founders, the same way. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, obviously, you you mentioned it earlier. There's really no historicity to these to these avatar appearances uh, to us. To me, it's very important if they're linked to history. Because I understand, I really do, and I think a lot of Christians would understand the Eastern view that these platitudes, moral platitudes, let's say, are, do not have to be li- linked to a historical person to be true. I would grant that. Um, well, in fact, in fact, I think I would deny Scripture if I didn't say that. Romans, Romans one and two argues that God has endowed every person coming to the world with two things, an ability to look around him and to see his existence in nature, and number two, look inside him and see an ethical consciousness. So if God creates people with an ethical conscience, which is one of the main teachings of the deists back before the German liberals, they tried to pick the five or seven things that all religion shared, and moral consciousness is always up there. So mm-hmm. It's like, duh, Romans 1 and 2. Now, I think that's true. But there are certain things you can't do that with. I mean, is it important that this that Jesus lived? Is that important for anybody? If it is, we got a lot of data. What about those like Christians who celebrate his death as a sacrifice? You talk about morals. What about a guy who dies for his friends? What about the guy that jumps on the grenade? Now, Jesus didn't exactly jump on the grenade. In the, in the passage you were talking about, when he was asked if he were the Messiah and the Son of God, and he switched to a Son of Man answer and said, I'll be sitting on the right hand of God, Jesus didn't have to volunteer that stuff. The fact that he said those things made really fast enemies. And so historical, his historicity is important. But most of all, Christianity is based on the resurrection of Jesus. Paul says, if Christ has been raised from the dead, the, the cross doesn't save your sins. Paul, Paul specifically says, you are yet in your sins. So if he's not raised from the dead, there's nothing else. I mean, no other specifically Christian doctrine holds. Now, if we have data and a lot of it for the resurrection using only the scholars which the critics allow, which is what I argue, um, if we have that kind of data for the resurrection, a resurrection be a lot different. Okay, someone says, how different? How would the, just for the sake of the argument, if I give you the resurrection, why would that be so different? And here's what I'd say. The resurrection changes one worldview to another worldview. The resurrection is the view that says there has to be sin in the world. Don't your view that there's no sin and my view that there's sin. There's got to be sin because in the Christian worldview, there wouldn't have been a death. Oh yeah, but that's child abuse. Uh, not hardly because in this sense, the child, Jesus, agreed to do it for everybody else. So there you have the ultimate altruistic act. So it's important to know he died on the cross. It's mostly important, according to Paul, maybe the world's best theologian of all time. um, Paul said, without the resurrection of Jesus, we've got nothing. 
uh, we, we've got nothing. So some events, some things, in this case, the key to Christianity, and we'd say to religion, you have to go back into history to examine the resurrection. You can, oh, that's a very nice idea that maybe sometimes we'll live beautifully in this life and maybe if we're lucky, we'll live forever. Well, you know, how about the guy who, who did live forever? Well, that didn't really, that's not really true. Great. I'm glad that, you know, you're, you're verbalizing your view. Let's talk about it. And now you're doing a dialogue in the resurrection. So some of the things that are important can't be divorced from history. Yeah. And that yeah. would be the main, you know, I don't, I don't deny, as I just hinted that, that, I would agree with maybe uh, a Muslim neighbor's ethics, a Hindu neighbor's ethics, a Buddhist neighbor's ethics. You may have heard that a Buddhist priest uh, set himself on fire in front of the White House just a few days ago. Uh, no, I didn't a, hear that. Yeah, it was in favor of the Green Green New Deal, I guess, you know, a pro-nature kind of thing. Well, we can talk about the uh, the the uh, importance of ecology. Norm Geisler had a chapter in his book on ethics, how Christians should uh, talk about nature and the importance as a creation of God. So we can talk about those things. And I can agree with non-Christians. But if you want to get to the heart of religion, here's my challenge. If Christ was raised from the dead, Christianity's true. If Christ was raised from the dead, it puts a new face on religion. So some conclusion, some things you've got to look at historically. We hope you have enjoyed part one of our discussion with Dr. Gary Habermas. There is plenty more from Gary to listen to right here on Apologetics Profile. See the links below to our other conversations with Gary on the resurrection and on near-death experiences. You can also check out the helpful and bountiful resources Gary has on his own website at GaryHabermas.com. That's Gary Habermas, H-A-B-E-R-M-A-S dot O-R-G. Coming up on part two next week, we delve into the importance of epistemic humility in sharing the truth of the gospel and how important it is for us to first understand our own book before we can be critical of the beliefs and ideas of other faiths. And of course, we here at Watchmen feature our Profile Notebook. Our 2022 edition features over 600 pages of easy-to-read four-page profiles of major world religions, cults, and other non-Christian ideologies and spiritual practices. You can get your copy either in printed or electronic format. For more information about the Profile Notebook, you can visit watchman.org slash notebook. That's watchman.org slash notebook for more information. For Apologetics Profile, I'm staff apologist Daniel Ray. See you next week. <laughs>